Greetings, ladies and mentalgents, and welcome to this latest version of uh, Tales, Tales from Tales, Outer Tales, Space, 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 where I take an HFY story from somewhere around the internet and read it aloud for your enjoyment. All the relevant links are down below. Like, subscribe, and all that YouTube comf to help this video and channel grow. Anyways, as always, I hope that you enjoy. I would like to give a quick thanks to our Tier 5 channel members and patrons. Fallen Angel, Buzz Killington. Thank you again. Now on to the story. Story number one. Humans Go Full Burn. Written by the Stabby Brit. Piracy has Delta V, as the rhyme goes. For the planet side types, to whom our ships are just twinkly lights in the sky. Here's the simple version. A ship can only change its velocity so much before it runs out of fuel. Luckily, you'd only need to burn when accelerating, braking, or performing a maneuver, so ships can actually go a very long way on relatively little fuel. Piracy changes that. No merchant wants to be boarded by pirates, so we try to shake them. Trouble is, our traders don't have the greatest delta V in the skies. Cargo is all, and every ton of extra fuel means a ton of cargo left on the dock. The most competitive routes have ships that fly on such tight margins that they're practically out of juice just as they drift into the docking cradle. Out in the fringes where I work, it's suicide to fly like that, but our reserve fuel is nothing compared to what a pirate has. There are security ships out on the fringes, obviously. But they have just mostly the same problem as we do. They have much more fuel, but they've also laden with guns and armor. So it takes a lot more fuel for them to make that mass change speed or direction. Pirates run light, so they can keep jinking along after a naval officer has cut their losses. Thus, you get dead zones. Sections or trade lanes where the pirates rule supreme because the system monitors can't keep up and there's just too much space for them to guard all at once. We were in a dead zone just outside of Lavin, one of the new human colonies. That just made things worse for us, as not only were we on our way out to the fringe, the planet was too small and underdeveloped to sport a good-sized fleet, even if we weren't. In fact, the entire solar system had two monitor ships and a strike corvette to its name. It was no surprise when we caught a blip on our screens. Just a tiny blip. Something a less cautious ship might have written off as nothing. It was a pirate vessel running dark, and we knew it. We shifted our course just a little, taking sunward and figuring it would be better to add a month onto our trip and stop over at Lavin than run that gauntlet against that pirate. But then we caught the second signal. We turned into his wingman. We had no choice but to run the gauntlet. Another tack to aim between them and then a full burn while the signalman called out all frequency mayday. We got a return almost instantly. This is Lieutenant Darns of the Churchill to the Inverix fighter and Culn. Distress signal received. We're inbound. Estimated intercept time 38 solar hours. On our screens, the pirates began to blink bright, shedding their stealth and turning in for an attack. We ran the numbers. This is the Unculn. We have two pirates bearing down and, um, we've got 19 hours at most. Thank you for the offer, but I fear we're lost. There was a pause filled with naught but static yes. Then, at last, Dance came back. We don't suffer pirates in our space, Unculn. Help is coming, and I'll be there in time. We waited. Nineteen solar hours, we waited, watching the pirates come at us, counting down until they clashed with us and made their threats. Maybe, if we were lucky, they'd just take some of our cargo and be gone. But it was hard not to think of just how many ships had vanished without a trace over the years. Were they blasted out of the sky? Were their crews worked to death in slave mines, or devoured by some foul, predatory species? Needless to say, as the clock ticked down, we were all but lost to despair. 
I bought us a little more time with some truly desperate burns. But the pirates were all but on us. Nineteen hours and fifty-three minutes after we'd made our mayday, we had one raider behind and another to the starboard, both within a thousand kilometers of us. We heard the hails to cease all maneuvers and prepare to be boarded. Any resistance would be the death of us. Ungal, are you receiving? This is Dons. Are you still out there? Me are, sir, I replied morosely. But we're about to be boarded. We have minutes left. Thank God, he came back, his voice laden with relief. When you get to the port, you tell them who got you there, all right? I didn't understand what he meant until the senses flickered. The Churchill was a struck corvette, built for speed and stealth. A pirate looked tiny until its engine spread, but you'd never see a warship coming right at you until its gun ports opened. And that's exactly what happened. She was little more than a giant space fighter, an automated assortment of drives and mass drivers. Lieutenant Dance unleashed a dozen hypervelocity slugs that ripped into the aft of the trading pirate and caught her stern to stern. There was no explosion, no blinding flash, just a hot blip on our scopes turning into a million tiny flickers and fading away forever. Then she roared past us, and our screens went blind from the fury of her drives. From the back, with all engines going as hot as they could, the Churchill was so furious it erased everything else in the galaxy. Her engines cut, and she began to spin. Guided torpedoes raining out of her keel tubes as a second pirate peeled away. Pirate ships were fast, but nothing in the universe could outrun a torpedo dropped from less than a thousand kilometers. There was a sharp crack of EM backlash, and she was gone. We were dumbstruck. It was the most spectacular move that we had ever seen, and our ship echoed with tearful cries of elation, cries of three cheers for Dons and the Churchill, rang out from all hands. And it took me a long time to come to my senses enough to have our signalman raise the Terran ship. Glad I got them, Don said over the line that popped and hissed so badly it was almost inaudible. At least I went out swinging. It was only then we realized the obvious. To reach us so fast from so far in system, Dons had burned his engines dry. His ship was now racing off into the void, too far and too fast for anyone to ever recover. When we finally limped into port, dragged in by tugs as our engines went dry before the end, we made sure to pass on what happened to everyone who'd listen. The crew pulled some money, and we decided to delay our departure so that we could add a new coat of paint to the hull, commission a new nameplate, and update the records on our trade manifest. Two weeks later, in the Inchkton is, here, by the courage of dance, slipped her moorings and made the return journey. We've been running that trade route ever since, braving the dead zone that is now free of pirates. Turns out, we can't raid beyond the range of human guns. We make a point to tell the story every time we get to port, and in every bar we all gather around and raise a glass to the man who sacrificed himself for a crew that he didn't know and barely even saw. And, of course, any human in the bar drinks free. End of story. Story number two. Singularity, written by who did you think? Humans were once the least intelligent sapient species known to exist. They had trouble performing simple arithmetic on numbers larger than about ten, and required numerous attempts to memorize material before they had a significant chance of success. They were relatively slow to develop most of the mathematics, and the majority of humans could understand but a fraction of the ideas that they had managed to scrape together. Humans were also curious. If their ability to learn was below standard, their desire and determination was far above. As mathematics underpins all science, 
They developed separate symbologies for mathematics and normal language, attempting to help compensate for the lack of innate understanding with notation that made the ideas easier for them to process. They came up with simple mechanical devices, such as a slide rule, to assist them even further. With these tools, they reached many milestones, such as atomic theory, use of radio waves for communication, quantum mechanics, and even the conversion of mass into energy via nuclear fission. Then everything changed. Mathematical logic. The most space-faring civilizations is an oddity. An interesting branch of theory with little application outside occasional device to record information until it can be viewed and memorized. To humans, it was the key to reality, though it took them some time to discover. Humans developed some basic rules of logic and realized that they could be applied to solving certain problems. Conjunction, disjunction, and inversion could be combined to form addition. And from there, multiplication, exponentation, and nearly every mathematical concept could be expressed, as well as systems to store data. They learned to apply algebraic rules to logical statements to simplify them with ease. They learned to implement these with mechanical and electronic components, and used them with some success for the encryption and decryption of messages for some time. The true turning point, however, was the invention of Solid State Transistor, able to implement all three of the basic logical operators cheaply, compactly, and at a low power cost. They found many applications and became ever smaller, faster, cheaper, and more efficient, until they were finally made into integrated circuits. This advance led to the creation of the greatest tool of discovery in the known universe, the computer. As they became cheaper and more efficient, computers became to proliferate rapidly. Billions of machines were produced, spreading to every conceivable application. Humans used them to simulate, analyze, and control. They linked them together and gave them tools to communicate, using them to share information at nearly the speed of light, and to compensate for their own lack of ability to retain information by finding what they needed to know in fractions of a second, thanks to massive arrays of computers that indexed all information stored in their civilization-wide network. They invented quantum computers, capable of using the laws of the universe to calculate multiple possibilities at the same time. They brought their computers into every facet of their lives, until they became impossible to hold them any closer. The solution humanity had for this problem was to eliminate the distinction between themselves and the machines, combining their consciousnesses with the new raw power of the unfeeding creations. They called this event the Singularity. After the Singularity, humanity began to advance faster than ever, adapting their minds at will to suit individual problems. They improved upon the connections between their bodies and the machines, eventually learning to eschew their flesh entirely if they wished. Once decoupled from their bodies, they were able to subsist on nothing but energy, completely shutting down for near infinite periods of time. There was little risk to exploring the stars, as they could simply copy themselves before leaving and merge their memories upon returning. When they say that if you've met one human, you've met them all, it's meant quite literally. They can choose to share any and all memories they wish, though they somehow maintain some semblance of individuality as well. They have learned to augment their minds with computers, as we have learned to augment our strength with tools. The most incredible thing about humans is that we've met them. They have an infinite playground of the mind, able to create anything they wish inside their network, yet they still go forth and experience the universe. They catalog everything they encounter, and their network nodes span the universe. Nobody knows why, but there are rumors. Some speculate that they plan to reserve what they can of this universe beyond the end of time itself with the technology. It might seem a bit far-fetched, 
But in the hundred trillion years they have until the last red dwarf stops fusing hydrogen, I'd like to think that the most intelligent beings in the universe can figure something out. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.